If you have your Bibles this morning, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 14, or scroll, whatever, however you access your Bible right now, feel free to turn there now. The story this morning that we're going to be looking at is regarded by many to be the most well-known of all of Jesus' miracles that he performed. So regardless of your level of, of Bible knowledge, regardless of how much you've been able to attend church throughout your life, the chances are that you know this story, that you have heard it before in some form or fashion, that it is familiar to you. This is the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 13 and going through verse 21. As soon as Jesus heard the news, that being the news of the death of John the Baptist, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, That isn't necessary. You feed them. But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven, and blessed them. Then, breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day, in addition to all the women and children. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the reading here, the immediate context in the book of Matthew to this event is that Jesus has learned about the death of John the Baptist. Now, if we were to look at this story in Mark, or if we had to looked at this story in the Gospel of Luke, we would have seen that, that preceding this event, we're told that Jesus was tired, and Jesus was hungry. So here is a man who has been giving of himself in ministry. He's been meeting the needs of people. And then on top of that, he learns about the death of someone he loved very dearly. And we see in this man a, a person of great need. Jesus himself had great need. Now, the break in our Bibles, at least in mine here, there's a break between verse 12 and verse 13. And I want to tell you that break is an artificial break. It's a break that an editor put in there to help us break up the chunks of the gospel so that it's easier to read. But in the original gospel writing, that break didn't exist. And so if we were to read it that way, we would see that no sooner does Jesus find out from the disciples of John that John's life has ended no sooner does he hear that, does he then leave in a boat to go to this remote place. Jesus sets off to be alone. Now, over the last week, as, as you may have already uh, come to find out through the emails that the church has been sending out, we, our church has experienced a, a rash of, of deaths connected to people who are a part of our congregation. So, Keep in mind, Jeff and, and Debbie and Kent, as they mourn the loss of those that they love dearly. Every one of us, no doubt, has experienced loss of some kind in our lives. And while it's true, we all tend to process our grief differently. We all handle the, the, those times in our own unique ways. The truth is, all of us, at some level, understand the need to be alone. The need to just go and, and get away from the crowds and process how we feel and what we're going through. And Jesus, according to Matthew's gospel here, is no different than you or I. Far from the stoic, impersonal picture of, of Jesus often portrayed in, in movies and in TV shows, this, this person who seems disconnected, almost like he's from some other world. And, and I guess you could say in a way... As the divine son of God he is, but he's not so, so far away that, that he's not connected to the everyday experiences of human life like you and I are. In the incarnation, Jesus made himself every bit as much human as you and I, yet without sin. But he still experienced grief, he still experienced heartache, he still experienced the whole range of human emotions as you 
and I do. And so Jesus, as we see here, was deeply emotional. Perhaps that's the reason among many. One of the many reasons the crowds were drawn to him. They could see in this man someone who was very much like they were. One who cared. One who loved. One who was moved by what was going on around him. From many towns, we're told, the people came out in droves to follow Jesus as he set out to go to this remote place. And so here's the picture that Matthew paints for us. This picture of Jesus on a boat, crossing water, but people on the shore seeing him and setting out on foot to go where he's going. This crowd that kept growing, who were watching his every move, anticipating where he might be, hoping they might head him off. The people followed Jesus, we're told multiple times throughout the Gospels, like sheep without a shepherd, confused, helpless. And Jesus, of course, recognized their plight. He saw the condition of their lives, and we're told he was moved to compassion. And they knew it. They knew that this Jesus cared about their needs. And so, we find that there's no small crowd represented here, is there? A pretty large group of people have, have followed him out into the wilderness, upwards of probably 10,000 people or more in total. And though his own needs were great, he was hungry, he was exhausted, he was grieving the loss of a loved one, he wanted to be alone, and yet his compassion for the people was greater than his own needs. And so, as he steps off the boat, he finds a mass of humanity, very needy, waiting for him on the other side. And what does he do? We're told he immediately begins attending to their needs. And this event results in the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels. The only miracle recorded in all four Gospels. Now, the miracle itself is amazing. I mean, I've always delighted in imagining what this was like. I mean, picture it. Every time the disciples returned to Jesus after handing out what they'd been given, they found more was there waiting for them. You know, the closest thing I can even compare this to is, is when I go to the, the, the seafood buffet at Captain George's to get more crab legs. There's always more crab legs there. It's amazing. And if, and if for some reason there's not, just wait a minute, and they're going to bring it right back out. It's like there's some magical source of crab legs back behind the doors. You almost picture like a rainbow coming out of it. Like this is, this is the source of all crab legs. It's a wonderful place. But we know, of course, that where the crab legs come from, there's, there's people who, who risk their lives for whatever reason to go out into the ocean to catch these things and bring them to the market and then the, and they're sold to the restaurant and they're delivered in a truck and then they're cooked in the steamer and they're brought out for you and me to enjoy. But how did it happen here? There was no, there was no one baking bread behind the scenes There was no one out catching fish, resupplying the stock. No, every time they returned, Jesus himself was multiplying what had been given to him. Did they get to see it actually replenish in his hands? We don't know. We don't know exactly what this looked like. All we know is that when Jesus provides and the food is distributed, that everyone is satisfied. I think the inclusion of this story in all four of the Gospels, is about much more than a guy who's able to multiply food. I believe that this story points to something on a much larger scale. Jesus' feeding of the masses in this deserted place, in this story, is a statement about who he is and what he has come to do. You see, the Jewish people in, in his day we're, we're deeply convinced that the messianic age, the, the age of, of history, when God's anointed one would come to the earth, they believed that that would mark the return of bread from heaven. You know their history. We've talked about it just in recent weeks. About Moses and, and the Israelites journeying, journeying through the wilderness. And how were they sustained on their journey for 40 years? Well, God produced manna bread from heaven to nourish his people. What about Elijah? In his own desert experience, God supernaturally provided for him 
with ravens. And so the expectation got to the point of, in Jesus' day among many Jewish circles that manna, miraculous bread from heaven, would once again descend as a sign of the consummation of the ages. And here, once again, in the wilderness, God was miraculously providing bread for his people. Don't miss the significance of that. Don't miss what that means. I don't think the people then missed the significance of what was happening to them. It's no coincidence in John's record of this miracle in chapter 6 that in response to what was happening, we're told that the people were planning to force him to be their king. The people were, they said, ah, this is the prophet. This is the one we've been waiting for. This is the one that God was going to send us. And now we're going to install him as our leader. And Jesus recognized what was happening. Here, the people saw a new Moses. Someone sent from God to prepare a messianic feast. Now, of course, the people didn't understand fully what was happening. But they understood enough. Jesus was making a tremendous statement and claim to who he was. Now, on this side of history, you and I know that this meant even something more. He's not just, this, this feeding of the, of the 5,000 and more is not just pointing back to the past works and the past promises of God. What he's doing here is highly anticipatory of what is to come in the future. That final messianic banquet at the end of history. If we were to flip a few pages back and back into Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus himself said this. He said, I tell you this, that the Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus himself is saying, at the end of time, God is going to gather his people from the Jews and the Gentiles and bring them together for a heavenly banquet. It's no small coincidence to me that in that verse there, verse 11 of chapter 8, the verb there, anaclino, to recline, is the exact same verb Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 14. Tell the people to sit. Tell them to sit. Tell them to recline on the grass. Jesus is putting in place on earth what will one day be in heaven. A banquet where God is providing sufficiently for the needs of his people. There was no one left hungry at the end. So much food was provided that there were leftovers. Enough to fill all 12 baskets full. Every gospel records that there was excess when Jesus provides He's pointing ahead to a future when God would so provide for his people that they would always have enough to the ends of eternity as they recline at the messianic banquet. The people were filled. The people were satisfied. I don't think it's, it's any coincidence. In fact, I think it's more than appropriate that in John's recounting of this in chapter 6, I, lo- I, found, I found myself going once over and over again to John chapter 6 to get a fuller picture of what's happening in this story. John connects this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 to Jesus' subsequent discourse on bread from heaven. So if you were to go look at John chapter 6, you'd see feeding of the 5,000, then Jesus in a miracle on the water, and then following that, people coming back to him asking for more, and he starts teaching them about bread that comes from heaven. Don't miss the point. Yes, Jesus is rehearsing for, for God's people that, that those past provisions of God in the wilderness, his, his people found themselves in need, God himself provided, and Jesus has come to provide again. But he's come to provide more than food for their bodies. Jesus has come to provide food for their souls. Those who only eat of bread of the earth will die but those who eat the flesh of Jesus. Those who partake of Jesus. Those who receive and are nourished and sustained by his life. Those people, oh, they will live forever. He himself is the bread. (laughs) 
He himself is the bread from heaven. The people saw the bread that he was multiplying in his hands as that bread from heaven. And Jesus is saying, no, that bread points beyond itself to me. I am what nourishes you. I am God's supply for you. I am God's provision for your life. I alone can sustain you. And when the people heard that, in John chapter 6, ironically enough, we're told they murmur. Where have we seen that before? Where have we seen the people murmuring over God's provision for their lives? Well, go back to the Exodus event. The whole generation of God's people who found themselves in the wilderness, we talked about it last week, who longed for the good old days of enslavement in Egypt, their response to God's provision for their lives was to complain. And they're no different here. Jesus is saying, this bread... This bread is not what life is all about. This bread points to me. I am the bread that nourishes and sustains your soul. And they complained about it. He says to them, you came back to me because I filled your stomachs, but I want to do so much more than that. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Jesus alone provides. Jesus alone sustains. Jesus alone is your life's provision. Now it's here, again in John's gospel, where something interesting happens. No sooner does Jesus reveal to them that the bread wasn't what he came to give, but himself, that people started leaving him in droves. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that very interesting about human nature? We think we know what we want, don't we? Oh, if God would just give me this thing. If God would just supply me this, this, this desire of my, this thing that I think I need. And God says, well, I will supply you what you need, but it's not what you think you need. I want to give you more than that. And all those tangible things I bless you with, those things that I've graciously provided you with, they're all meant to point beyond themselves to what the greatest need of your life is, and it's myself. And when we hear that, we, we don't really want that, do we? And so, in John's gospel, we're told that people began deserting him. And by all accounts, it's not just one or two people. Everybody, everybody's leaving Jesus. It's to the point where Jesus is looking at the 12 that he handpicked to join him in his ministry. He says, are you guys leaving me too? Look, they're all gone. The, the masses that have followed us out here, that we've been ministering to for days on end, that we've provided miraculously for, everyone is gone. Are you leaving me too? Peter, very honestly, and I appreciate his honesty, where, where else would we go? It's not, no, Jesus, we would never leave you. We love you. We want to be with you every day. No, it's the, we don't have anywhere else to go, so I guess we're, we're staying here. Those who choose to remain with Jesus must face some, some facts about him. They have to face some, some hard truths about the way that Jesus operates. And I want to spend the remainder of our time here together looking at three of those this morning. And the first is this. Jesus' ways can be hard to comprehend. The people, by the thousands, had come to him with a multitude of needs. I, I would presume that there were about as many needs represented in that mass of people as there were people. Everyone came to Jesus needing something from him. At least at some point, they all needed to eat. Every person had a need of some kind. And he met every single one of those needs. There's no indication in any of the Gospels that anyone walked away disappointed with, with Jesus providing what they were asking for at that moment. At least in, initially. And yet, they abandoned him the moment that staying with him became any way difficult. We wanted a king! We wanted to make him king, but he won't do what we want. We expected him to do so much more than he did, and he didn't deliver. Oh, we want to listen to his teachings, but they're so confusing. 
It's too hard to understand. You know, now that I think about it, John the Baptist's head ended up on a platter. And I bet you this guy's will too. It's too risky. You see the way people think when the going gets tough? (laughs) As you and I weigh our own commitments to follow Jesus, are you and I prepared for when the going gets tough? What if Jesus doesn't do what you want him to do? What if Jesus' plans don't align with your plans? Will you keep following him then? What if he doesn't deliver the goods, those things that we expected him to deliver? What if he chooses to give us something less than what we were expecting? You know, it has been said that unmet expectations are the silent killer of relationships. What do you do when Jesus doesn't meet your expectation? Are you and I willing to put in the effort required to listen to Jesus, to understand what he's saying, and to put what he says into practice? Are you and I willing to put in the time and the effort to place ourselves in that position to hear him when he speaks? Are we willing to do the work? It's work understanding these words. And yes, we have the Spirit of God to give us help, and without Him, we could never understand anything that's being said. But you and I have to have some skin in the game. Are you and I willing to do that? Are we willing to to make the sacrifice that it's required to put His words into practice? Are you and I willing to risk even our lives that we might follow Him? That's not only true, these questions are not only true for each of us individually, I believe these questions are true for, the, for our church as a whole. A church that's in a season where we're dreaming of the future. What is God's, what is God's plan? What is God's purpose? Where is God leading? What are his ways to get there? And as we ask those questions, as we're trying to discern what, what is coming around the corner, what is next for his, for his plans for our lives together, his ways... They can come across as hard to understand. There's going to be challenges to obeying what we hear him say. Will we embrace his ways? Will we embrace them even when they go against our logic, even when they go against all reason, even when they don't make any sense and they come across as really hard? Or will we join the masses in walking away from him when the going gets tough? Jesus' ways can be hard. But secondly, they are always better than our own. The ways of God, his ways are above our ways, his ways are beyond our ways, his ways are not our ways, and his ways are always better than our ways. Did you notice, we've already been hitting on it already this morning, but did you notice where this miracle occurred? We're told it was in a remote area. That's how the NLT describes it, a remote area. Think windfall or beyond windfall. We're talking middle of nowhere. Don't think for a second that Jesus wasn't aware of the people as he was heading to this beyond windfall location. Don't think for a second that he he isn't aware of what's happening. You don't just not see 10,000 people. I mean, if, yeah, word is spreading and, and people are getting an idea. But again, the, the picture here is people see him on the water. He, uh, he undoubtedly saw them. This one who's just escaping to this remote area is, is without doubt aware of what's happening. In fact, if, if we, again, going back to John chapter 6, we see that Jesus is, is actually has something up his sleeve. Jesus is not only aware of what's going on, he has a plan here. We know from verse 15 of John chapter 6 that when Jesus really wants to get away from the people, he can. When they go to to force him to be their king, we're told he slipped away completely. Jesus can be as elusive as he wants to be. And yes, there's there's this He's very, a very real picture of a man grieving and fatigued and hungry who's looking for a respite, but there's also this awareness that he has something bigger in mind. 
than just his own needs being met. It's almost as if Jesus is leading them there. I can't help but escape from this idea that, that there's this, he, he's drawing the people out to the middle of nowhere. Yes, he has tremendous need. But if, again, going back to John chapter 6, when Jesus is interacting with Philip, you can't help but get this sense that Jesus has something in mind. He's planning something. There's something intentional at work. He's doing something. He's positioning people to experience the miraculous. And I think that sometimes in life, if not often, He does the same thing for you and for me. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Jesus has this way of drawing us out into the wilderness. Out to that place of of discomfort. That place of trial. That place of difficulty. That place where we know we can't make it another day. If he doesn't provide. In fairness, we got to give the disciples a little bit of credit here. On their own, they came up with a pretty reasonable plan, didn't they? It makes sense. The people are hungry. It has gotten late. We have no, there's no, there's no Wegmans down the street. There's no, there's no kitchen of, of replenishing crab legs. The people need to eat. So Jesus, send them away. Send them home. Go home, replenish, get, your, get a nap, you know, get a drink, whatever you need, and then we'll resume what's going on. Jesus, this is a reasonable plan. It makes sense. And sure, it would have accomplished their objective. If feeding the stomach was the, the, the ultimate plan of Jesus, then I think their plan was, was a great idea. But I think he had something bigger in mind, didn't he? Jesus was planning something bigger. Listen, there's a lot of churches that come up with some really great plans. And those plans sound great. They make a lot of sense. They can meet a lot of needs. They can do a lot of good things. But Jesus' plans are always bigger. Always. His plans are always better. His ways were not their ways. And Jesus has a way of not only leading us to places where we're forced to rely upon him, but he also asks things of us in those moments that force us to adjust to what he's trying to do. It's hard. It's hard when God puts you in a tough position and says, you now need to adjust to me. You have to do what I'm wanting to do in your life. Left to the disciples' ways, the people absolutely would have been fed. But Jesus' ways resulted in the glory of God. There's a big difference there, isn't there? When they adjusted to what he was doing, he was able to do the miraculous in their midst. Are you and I willing to adjust to what God's bigger plans and purposes might be? Not just for our individual lives, but for the life of this church. Will we be obedient to his ways of accomplishing his plans? Will you and I trust the one that asks the ridiculous of us that he will also provide what is needed to see it fulfilled? Tough question. Lastly, and perhaps even most shockingly, Jesus wants to incorporate us (laughs) into his plans. Isn't that shocking to you? It is to me. The one who who has all the ability in the world to, to, to multiply anything miraculously as he wishes deigns to invite us to join him in what he's doing. Early this, thurs, this past Thursday morning, I had to get up earlier than normal. 4.30. Now for some of you, 4.30 is nothing. I mean, Gary Martin, you're probably, you probably already run like 10 miles or something by 4.30 in the morning. I don't think, Gary, do you even sleep? I mean, he's like the Energizer Bunny. The guy never runs out of energy. It's amazing. 4.30 for me is very early. 
I had to get up early because I had to drive all the way to Raleigh to receive my mother, who I won't point her out to you because she'd probably disown me if I did that. But my mother has come to spend three weeks with us, and we are, we've been looking forward to this week uh, for, for a long time. We're so excited to have her here, and I hope as you've cross paths with her that you'll let her know how welcome she is. She, I think in many ways she views this as her, her, her church home away from home. Just over the years, you have so welcomed her and my dad when he was with us. You welcomed my parents, and it's been a beautiful thing to see. And I know many of you think about her and pray for her. It's, it's such a blessing to me. And so here I was driving through the dark on, what is that, 64 that goes over to Raleigh? You know, at 4.30 in the morning, there's not, many, there's not that many people out there, especially once you get past, what is that, Williamston? Between Williamston and Rocky Mount, it's like driving through, like, a black hole. There is nothing there. There's no, there's no town. There's no house. There's no cars on the road. It was me in the darkness. And here I was driving through the darkness, and I had been listening to the podcast, originally a Pastor Aaron sermon from a few weeks ago. That was the first chance I'd had to listen to it. And then after that, I was listening to Chelsea's uh, sessions from the women's conference. And something happened to me as I was driving through the dark early in the morning. There I was in the middle of nowhere trying, trying to stay awake because I was still pretty groggy, but I had tears literally just running down my, my face. I was so overwhelmed as I listened to these two servants of God pouring out their hearts for God's people. I was so overwhelmed by the fact that God chooses to bless his people with other people. I'm just so thankful, filled with gratitude. My heart was overflowing for these servants who have, who have surrendered themselves to the Lord and whom God is using to minister to me. And then I began thinking, by extension, all of you, this incredible church, we say real life, real love, and it's true. The life and love of God is being made manifest in the world through your lives. It's this remarkable, amazing thing. I found myself feeling so unworthy to be a part of this church. What have I done to deserve being a part of you? You new members, what have you done to deserve to be a part of this church? You've done nothing. It is an act of God's grace. It is God's gift of himself. And God does that through others. It's amazing. And whenever I begin to think about these things, I find myself bordering on, on, on blasphemy. Because there's this strange tension at work between God, who is the one who provides, who alone can meet the needs of his people, and the fact that he chooses to use you and me to do it. And, it, and I don't ever want to say that God can't do it without us, but for whatever reason, God won't. The miraculous things that God wants to do in the world, he will not do apart from through you and me. And I find myself feeling I'm bumping up against some heresy or something. Like, I don't want to say something about God that isn't true or, or in any way undermines or undercuts his sovereignty or his power or his providential work in the world. But the bottom line is, over and over and over again, God does his work through the hearts of his people surrendered to him. Verse 16 of Matthew chapter 14. Jesus says, this plan of yours, however great, however reasonable, is not necessary. And yet, he says, you feed them. There's that tension. Do you, do you see the tension? Your plans, your ideas, your efforts are not necessary. And yet, you feed them. <laughs> what are you saying, Jesus? Jesus? Well, it's my plan. It's my plan. It's your effort. My plan, your effort. We all know who is responsible for the miracle here. No gospel writer attributes the miracle to any of the disciples. That'd be preposterous. The disciples did nothing miraculous here. And yet, by all intents and purposes, the disciples pretty much did everything except the miracle. I don't see Jesus handing a single piece of bread or a single piece of fish to a single person other than the disciples. He's doing the multiplying. He's doing the miracle, but he leaves it up to them to distribute it, to pass it around. What an amazing lesson that is. Not just to the 12, but to all of us. Jesus provides 
the disciples deliver. Say that again in your head. Jesus provides. His disciples deliver. His disciples distribute. His disciples carry out the work. Undoubtedly, this event was a significant training exercise for his disciples, one they undoubtedly never forgot. You know every one of them carried this story in their minds and hearts for the rest of their lives, the lesson that they learned that day. A number of years ago, my wife and I were at a dinner party in Mississippi. We were there at the, the dinner table with uh, six, eight other people, all close friends, people we loved. And as was customary, we had a, a wonderful meal, and then after the meal was over, we, we just stayed at the table, and we told stories and shared experiences and, and encouraged one another. It was a wonderful time. And one of the people sit, sitting at the table was someone you've heard me refer to before, especially in Bible study. I've mentioned his name several times. His name is Chuck. Chuck is one of my best friends ever. Chuck was the one who discipled me in college, who invested in me. I owe so much of my, of my walk with Christ to Chuck. And whenever Chuck speaks, I listen. I listen. There's, there's profundity in what he says. It comes from a deep, a deep walk with Jesus. It comes from years of study and life experience. And, and he's someone I know I can trust when he speaks. I can listen. And Chuck was telling a story. And I was hanging on every word. This story of one, of one time he had gone to, a, I think it was an Anglican church. It was a church that he wasn't used to going to. And, and I was waiting as the story began to build momentum. And I sensed everyone, there's this, this holy silence in, at the dining table. Like, where is the story going? What, what's going to be the, the conclusion? What, what deep, mysterious truth about God are we about to learn? And so Chuck tells the story of how the time for communion came and, and he came forward and he, he knelt down and he, he opened his hands to receive the elements and the priest took the bread and he pressed it deep into Chuck's hand. And Chuck said, that really left an impression. Hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Only Chuck could pull off a story like that. In all seriousness, imagine the impression that this had on the disciples. Imagine it. You and I have never seen anything like this. Well, maybe you have. I don't, I don't, think, you, I don't think we have seen anything quite like this in its scale. And it's how public it was. I mean, Jesus is flipping the laws of nature upside down. Bread doesn't just replenish itself. You know, I, I've said once upon a time that someone needs to invent the coffee pot that never runs out of coffee. And I think Pat or somebody sent me a, a picture recently of a coffee pot and a straw sticking out of it. It's like, here, this is what you need. No one's ever invented that yet. There's no such thing as a coffee pot that, that supernaturally replenishes itself like some spring of living water. Jesus is flipping nature upside down. And he's teaching them this lesson. He is the one who provides. He is the one who sustains. He is the one who does the work. And they are the ones who carry it out. It was something that left a deep, necessary impression upon their lives. If his movement would continue beyond his life, they had to understand that, if nothing else. Every piece of bread I give you, Jesus says, every piece of fish I offer you will be replenished with another. In my hands, your resources never run out. Ever. Oh, the extravagance. Oh, the excess. When the provision of Jesus never runs out. Oh, the abundance that is left over. It's amazing. The synergism of God's grace at work through people surrendered to him is astounding. He supplies every need, every need, but he does it.
in experiencing God, Henry Blackaby says, when God is about to do something, he takes the initiative to come to his servants and reveal his purposes and plans. He involves his people to accomplish his purposes through them. I think he nailed it. How sad when you and I feel like the burden is on us to dream up what we want to go do for God. How many lives have you seen? How many of you are represented by what I'm talking about here where you've spent all this time and effort trying to think, what do I need to do for God? What do I need to do to please him, to make him happy, to do something that that makes a difference in the lives of someone else? What do I need to do? I, I, and suddenly it's all about us. Like it's up to us to think of these things and do these things on our own. When we make these long-range plans based on our own priorities, and Blackaby says, no, what's important is what God plans to do through you. It's not your plans. It's God's plans. It's not your ways. It's God's ways. That's what matters. And as you and I stand on the threshold of tomorrow, it is of the utmost importance that we as a church choose to join God in his work and not the other way around. Oh God, we really want to do this thing. Will you come and bless it? We've got it all backwards. It should be, God, what are you doing? What do you want to do through us? We will join you in your work. And then he will take our resources. He will take Whatever meager, pitifully inadequate thing we have to offer him, we can give him, as one pastor once described, we give him our sack lunch. And we will watch him take what little we have to offer, and he will multiply it and multiply it and multiply it until there's more at the end than what we had at the beginning. And we can watch him do the miraculous in our midst that will result, not in our glory, but in his. His ways are always better than our own. So why then do we insist on clinging to our own ways? You've heard the story before about the woman whose baked ham was legendary for its taste and quality. There was no other ham like it. Barbara, I'm sorry. Your ham is amazing, but her ham was better. Part of her careful regimen in preparing her ham was to take a knife and cut, an e- cut a little bit off each end before putting it in the oven. And people who, who, who had her ham and watched her, her preparation all assumed that it was just a really critical part of her secret. This is how the ham tastes so good. She does something that no one else is doing. And so they came to her and said, tell us about this critical secret of yours to making your ham so legendary. And she said, well... That's the way my mother did it. So the woman got to thinking, maybe I'll ask mother what what the secret is. So she goes to her mother and says, Mother, tell me, what is the secret behind you cutting both ends off the ham and making it so delicious? And her her mother said, well, my mother did it. And so the two were now really intrigued. And so they went and found found grandma. And they wanted to know the secret from grandma before she passed away. And the secret was lost forever. And they said, Grandma, why did you always cut both ends off the ham before baking it? To which grandma said, well, the pan was too small. <laughs> you know, our traditions can be a lot like that. We all have our, every church has its own traditions. It doesn't matter how high church, low church you are, how formal, liturgical, how Pentecostal, whatever it is, whatever you call yourself, every church has its traditions. Every church has its way of doing things. And let me tell you something. Oftentimes, it's like that. Unthinking repetition of meaningless behavior serves no purpose other than to do it. What, have you ever, ever asked yourself, why do we do this thing? Why do we have this thing? Why is this here or that there? What, why do I care about this thing? Or that? Have you ever stopped to consider that? I'll end with one more quote from Experiencing God. You cannot rely on a tradition, 
on a method or a formula. Often people trust these things because it's easier to do that than to cultivate an intimate walk with God. Ooh, that hurts. I love my tradition. I love my routine. I love my regimen. I love my way of going about doing things. And Blackaby says, if you love that more than Jesus, you've got your priorities all wrong. Knowing the will of God and the voice of God requires a devotion of time and effort to cultivate a love relationship with him. That's what he's ultimately after. It's not our traditions. It's our walk, our heart, our lives with him. And Jesus said it himself, going back to John chapter 6. To these people who had come back to him for more, Jesus says, The only work God wants from you, the only work, is to believe in the one he has sent. That's it. God doesn't want your tradition. He doesn't want your way. He doesn't want your plan. He doesn't want your dreams. God wants your faith. Are we going to be a faithful church? Are we going to cling to our way of doing things? Or are we going to let it go and walk with Jesus? Is there any limit to what he can do through a church like that? I don't think so. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, I thank you once again for challenging me to let go of my way of doing things. To surrender to you my plans, my purposes, my own dreams and desires and aspirations. Lord, may all of us take those things and lay them down at your feet. Lord, we surrender to you our minds, our hearts, our wills. Lord, we even surrender to you our dreams. Fill that, that vacancy with your own. Fill these open empty hearts with your desires, your affections, the things that move your heart. Fill our minds and our imaginations with your own dreams and guide us as we commit not to a a plan or an agenda, but to a person. Lord, lead us and provide and do the miraculous in our midst. Not so that we can pat ourselves on the back, but so that you can reveal the glory of God to the nations through us. Lord, that is our heart's desire. Have your way with EMC. And we will give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.